Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 21. Tonight is going to be a more serious one and uh, it's important to me as well. Uh, this is 10 years too late for me to do something for this. But for those of you who don't know or maybe you do know, I was in the service, I was in the Navy. I served from 01 to 05. Um, when you go into boot camp after you get done, you go to school and depending on what job you're going, I was an undesignated, meaning I didn't have a certain job specifically yet and I got to strike it, which means take a test and if you pass, you become that job. Anyway, went to Great Lakes, graduated boot camp, went through some, a little bit of school, and then my ship, USS Lake Champlain, was stationed in the San Diego, California. And I got out there, and I was put in these this like barrack building, kind of like apartment buildings, and I was doing stuff on the base, uh, like planting trees, picking up trash, stuff like that, waiting on my ship to come back because they were on de deployment, I think like nine or 10 months. Well, when you first get on your ship, I think it came around June-ish of 2002, it came home and we went on and most people or half the ship leaves and then the other half stays. Well, when you've been out to sea that long and away from your family, the new people, they've been, we've been kind of hanging and chilling on base in San Diego. So they kind of are like cold shoulder to us. They didn't talk to us much. They were rude with their answers for a little while until you earn yourself. Well, one person really stands out in the engineering department. He wasn't the same job as me, but we became extremely close in long-term things in the Navy. Um, his name was Bemis. Keith was his first name. Uh, he was an engine man. I was a gas systems turbine mechanic, or that's what I struck because I was undesignated. Anyway, <clears throat> point being, when we got on the boat, on the ship one of the only people that were friendly helping like would help us learn shit on the boat on on base just real helpful in general with the jobs was bemis this guy was a nice guy uh, an extremely nice guy that was always motivational would always tell me positive things about well it could be this you know it could be way worse doing this and most of us on the ship and if, i know some of them will be listening knew bemis as the walking textbook like he, if you asked him about an engine or a boiler or how something worked outside of the engineering department, he could break it down to you and tell you like tech manual, step by step by step. You might need some coffee to make it through it, but he knew his stuff. And he was always, if you asked him for help, like lifting something, moving something, you needed a ride somewhere, needed a couple extra bucks. I mean, the dude would do anything with you. And I actually got to know him quite well, uh, us being in the same birthing, even though we weren't the same job. Um, we got to know each other quite well. We went out <clears throat> on Liberty and went out together, several ports together. And when I got out of the service, he came to school in Great Lakes and he came and visited me in Rockford and stayed at my house a few times. He even started dating a girl out here in Rockford. Uh, well, I live in Rochelle now, but it was dating a girl in Rockford. And me and her and him, we had gone out to the bar and had a couple of drinks. And um, he ended up getting stationed again, I think in San Diego. Yeah, in San Diego. And went out there uh, in 2012. Uh, he was found dead in his apartment. And um, people came to his dad and told him it was suicide. And after you hear the interview that's about to come up with his father. Mind you, I have not ever talked to Tony ever, his father, other than through Messenger. And I feel like I haven't done enough for Keith because when you hear this story and you wonder how they could have ever closed this case and put it, ruled it as suicide, will literally bamboozle your brain. He had all kinds of slurs and stuff written on his body, just messed up things. And so I just need you to know this also that this this interview may get out a kind of kind of crazy, you know, and kind of uh, just you're going to hear some things you don't really want to hear. So just uh, it's not for the faint of heart. So just be aware of that. We're going to play a couple. Uh, we're going to play a couple promos that Jackson and I made. And then after that, we'll be back with Tony Bemis, the father of a murdered son, a murdered friend of mine. A murdered shipmate and just a murdered really good person. We'll be right back with Tony Bemis on the Catch Another Carter and Fan Podcast. Hey, it's Jackson from Life with Jack. After this video, take a moment to scroll down 
to my videos and don't you worry if you like them more are coming soon and subscribe like and ring the bell of notifications so you don't miss out on another good video hey you yeah you over there do you have an idea a podcast idea something that would go great on this show that somebody should know about that you or somebody that you know could tell us about send us an email at catching up with carter at gmail.com that's catching with no g in the middle catching up with carter at gmail.com we want to know your ideas and we want to talk about them toodaloo all right, welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for clicking this link. Um, I'm welcoming Tony Bemis, the father of a real good friend of mine and shipmate from the USS Lake Champlain. I served with him from 02 to 05, and then I got out. Welcome, Tony. How are you today? Pretty good, Jeff. Uh, thank you for talking to me tonight. Absolutely. Um, I gave a little brief a real brief uh, intro, and you'll hear it when you play the, the, the podcast, but when in 2012, I got notified that my friend had passed away, and, and from people from the ship, he had caught some word that, or they had caught, you know, heard that it was suicide, and I never... Uh, you, you came approached me and several other shipmates and saying you know you needed some help doing an investigation and I, and I remember even seeing some really messed up photos but please tell the story what happened that day you 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 found out that our poor friend and your son John had passed away well uh, let's see so on August 7th 2012 we were my wife and I were just finished up getting ready to have some some dinner and we know some people in the brown uniform the door look like they're lost this is like late you know in the afternoon early starting early evening and uh, anyway we know the keiko came and introduced themselves and we said they said are you the parents of uh chief selectee chief petty officer selectee john keith bemis and we said we are they said well it's our duty to inform you and we're sorry to inform you that your son had passed away. Uh, we found that he was found this morning uh, dead at his, his uh, condo in Spring Valley, California. And we said, oh no, it cannot be. And uh, we kind of like hit a little hit the, the, door, the house door in trying to, in belief, shock. And the Navy spent uh, two or three days uh, talking about burial, uh, life insurance, you know, those type of things, trying to tie loose ends up. And uh, we spent uh, those two, two or three days talking about what Keith was like as a child, as a young adult, and uh, basically becoming the person that not only we knew, but many people knew as friends in, uh, in our small uh, town that we lived in, and Ohio, as well as uh, people in Texas and also California had, had grown to know. And uh, we had called uh, the commander on the ship of the USS Independence, and they said this looked like a parent suicide. And uh, so what we did was we went through, got everything tidied up with the Navy in terms of finances, uh, will and so on like this, and then went out to see Keith's memorial service in the USS Independence uh, the week of the 16th in uh, 2012. And it was uh, kind of uh, nerve wracking to go through and, you know, uh, meet under those conditions, his fellow shipmates, his officers, which are all very nice and so on. Uh, we had a Taco Tuesday meal, which is done in, uh, for, the, for everybody eating the day, but uh, it's something that Keith liked to do. Uh, a chance to also uh, see the ship where he had done uh, his, he had sat during take his ship to the Panama Canal in 2012, uh, as well as where he worked with water and air conditioning, coolant, things like this. And uh, they went over to, I want, I and my kids, and the kids and I went to uh, his apartment, Spring Valley, and saw uh, it's just things being tidy up and things like this. And we spoke to uh, the Master Chief and also uh, the uh, Chief, other Chief Petty Officers, 
regarding the condition of the house and also saw the blood stain where our son had passed away in his bedroom apartment. So that's what that week was like and coming back. It's just preparation, for coming preparing for his funeral in uh, the, and the uh, early Tuesday of that next week. So probably like 21st of, uh, of, uh, of uh, August that way of 2012. So that's how we um, more or less found out about things. While we're out in San Diego, the, we t contacted the uh, Living Grove Sheriff's Department who had done the investigation of his death and we got a police report, but they said, do not talk to us because we're not doing the investigation. Uh, San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office did the investigation, Lenore, uh, I just caught with that. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, eventually during the time back, um, I spoke with her and she was the uh, official in the scene, along with Lemon Grove Sheriff's, uh, Lemon Grove Sheriff's Office from California. And uh, uh, I said, well, how do you know it's a suicide? Well, the angle, bullet comes to the ceiling, reflections and things like this. And also that during the time that uh, he was going out to see his girlfriend leave him, his girlfriend's from Tijuana, Mexico. And that also uh, poorly according to his uh, doctor, actually it was a, it was a nurse uh, that uh, saw the uh, folks at Navy in the base, that uh, the job may have been too stressful according to her, as well as the girlfriend going out and seeing other people while he was out at sea. So during that time, uh, we started to think, this does not seem like Keith at all uh, committing suicide. He loved God very much loved our country, loved us, uh, valued life a lot, very faithful, devoted to God, uh, appreciated knowing that life has a purpose, you have a purpose in life, and respect that purpose. So uh, we went to, uh, uh, let's see, some of the Ohio Senators, Congressman Jordan, for example, tried to get contact with doing, getting the military investigation done that way, but we really had, a, his, his mom and I had a really terrible time trying to get uh, the Navy to investigate, the NCIS to investigate on uh, his death because if he was found on his property, then the NCIS was not going to investigate. It had to be a police or sheriff investigation at that time. And uh, found out that uh, the sheriff's investigation only lasted maybe like an hour and a half, two hours. So within three to five hours, including paperwork at the very end, typing up, everything was closed for Keith. They only interviewed one person, and that was a neighbor uh, that lived next door to uh, him. If you want to stop me anytime, you ask questions, you want to get off you know, your chest and so that people you know and also get it out there, I appreciate it, okay? Yeah, absolutely. No, I want you to explain exactly what you're doing. You're doing great. Um, I just have questions. I, I didn't explain in the beginning why you'd have this investigated. Now, after I've read the report, it screams investigation. Can you go into a, a decent amount of detail why you feel there's no chance it was? I, we know how he was, as, or at least I do and you do, as a character, as he was a big helper and, and a lover, and he was excited to make chief. He'd been waiting to make chief his entire career, and I, I know that firsthand because I know he studied so much for that. He told me that so many times. But what what was his body found in what condition in his apartment for you to question it was suicide or murder? Okay, well, uh, I saw uh, there's uh, someone named Tim that is a part of the Navy and uh, not now, but he, um, I, I said, what's that big blood stain? Because one of the chiefs that was visiting us, uh, they came out to California for the celebration. He wanted to show me. I uh, did not really want to show him, but he showed me the blood stain where Keith had passed away. And I said, oh my goodness, what is that big round area in his blood stain? And uh, the mentioned man I just mentioned, mentioned that it's a, how he's wearing his full face blood, uh, motorcycle helmet. And he, Keith supposedly was lying face up and a gun to his right hand side, his horse, 40 caliber tours. And I'm thinking, well, you know, as, as we get back to Ohio, his mom and I, so we went through and I went through the pictures and I, I had my phone charged because the last thing I took before the battery ran out, 
on my phone was that picture. And I think, oh my goodness. So when I, I got it going, the phone going, I said, oh no, this is not a, uh, just a photo, uh, a picture of photo. I don't think it's a photo. I think it's an actual face, face down. Cause it has eyes, nose, ears, and mouth. And on the forehead is a drawing of Satan on it, you know? And because uh, as eyes, nose, uh, the pointy ears and everything, the beard. And uh, something right there just did not seem right. So instead of being found face up like the uh, Lenore person had mentioned, I'm just going to go with that. Uh, she had um, mentioned that, uh, that, that she found him face up. Uh, plenty of time for to uh, the blood was still wet yet, but not enough to really uh, be wet. So when she tried to turn him over, she would make an imprint in the uh, the, the uh, face. And uh, anyway, it's just just to no, know if I turned him over just to see what was going on in his injury in the back of his neck, his face would not make the imprint because of the blood not wet enough for that to happen. So I said, okay. And, uh, so anyway, um, she, uh, so I'm going with that back to Ohio and, uh, we months started, uh, passing by and, and anyway, uh, there's my wife at that time had gone through and, um, made a call to a, uh, a newspaper reporter out of California who keys supposedly had done a welfare check along with somebody else on a sailor on the same ship of a welfare check who had got stabbed so many times because he thought he was dating a girl who was going to sign his life insurance or life insurance over to and as like he was like fall in love with and marry and then you know uh, you know she'd be a beneficiary it was actually two guys that came over and stabbed him and Keith and the other person supposedly went through and did a welfare check. So this person was a reporter. So can you send us information, some photos, things like this? I said yes. So anyway, uh, another person that associated with that reporter said, "I'm I'm a person that does a type of thing where I look at body, body. Um, uh, I say body. Uh, listen, that identifies people because of body. If they're missing or dead, and I go through and look through medical records and things like this. I'm able to find them." And I'd like to look along with you. And I said, okay, that's good. And anyway, it turned out that she was looking at photos. And one night she goes, do you know there's some hair in your son's teeth? And I said, I can't find it. Well, let me circle it and then send you an email. And I found the hair between my son's teeth. It could be happened to anything, but generally, you know, people don't find a lot of hair in their teeth. You know, it's a kind of like a rarity. So I think that just looks weird. and. And, uh, and, the, and the, she said that it looks like he had his ears are tied back, pinned back, like being like something wrapped around them. And from that got, from that point on, I started looking at little things like, like going, taking pictures of the pictures that are, because it's like drying, watching paint dry and you're trying to see where it needs improvement. And I'm seeing like imprints of images that are on his face that should not be there. And the more, 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 that I started looking at his pictures, that I see things like numbers on certain parts of his body, uh, bad words such as homosexual slurs are on his body, his face, his, 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 his left butt cheek, uh, numbers written on the, his penis. Uh, in addition to that, uh, homosexual slurs written on his carpet, especially in front of his mirror, uh, on his uh, leather headboard, his dresser, those type of things. And my, his mom and I did hire an investigator from California to look at, investigate his death, but he found trouble uh, when he tried to talk to people on the ship. And then he found out that if they had to, they, they talked to our investigator, they would have to sign a paper saying, a form saying by them from the Navy that they would not do so again. And one person we know that was, she's retired this time, but she mentioned that if there's a possibility that the Navy would take the retirement way if they, they spoke with us. And uh, from that point on, the investigator was with us for about a year or so. And uh, uh, we had trouble really going beyond, much more beyond that. 
I think that he may have been kind of uh, given some pressure to not pursue any farther uh, than he did, but he thought it was a murder and not a suicide. Uh, so beyond that, this is like in 2013, uh, we started to just asking questions to different people, kept looking, um, and then uh, I started to on my own in 2015, 16, 17, 18, started looking at pictures more, taking pictures. I'm finding these slurs on his face, numbers on his tongue, numbers on his penis. Uh, drawing on his leg, a lady holding a baby, looking at his private parts, uh, the imprints and homosexual slurs on his motorcycle, helmet leather, uh, I mean, on his um, bike leather, on his sets, uh, his, like I said, his, his leather headboard, his ceiling, his living room, uh, walls in the, uh, in the hallway, uh, above the towel rack, uh, just everywhere. And uh, eventually, my, uh, his mother and I got uh, some swabs that were taken through California for having his blood. I mean, his, his guns examined in California. And we got those taken to a lawyer who got those sent into a, uh, a forensic place in, uh, in Ohio. And it came back that his, there was not enough blood on there. So I had to go through and get a DNA test and did prove that the gun was owned by Keith. And the lawyer that I spoke to, his opinion was, there's barely any blood on the gun. Your son's gun had, had to be cleaned. And I spoke to people, which I worked with at the time, uh, the school nurse and also a uh, policeman in, uh, in uh, near the school where I worked. And he said, your guns, your son's guns were clean. It was that, well, all that happened, they had to be cleaned. So that's what we looked at. And we also went to, uh, to uh, change.org, put it on, uh, a description of what happened there and uh, anyway somebody from a uh, former NCS agent slash chief petty officer offered to he also sergeant arms he was also responsible for them as an NCIS agent as well to try to uh, investigate this and do some justice and he, he goes if you really want to um, uh, I, me too I can I can help you out I'd like to help a brother out so he started looking at things and he said, did you get your, did you get his uniform, anything back, any documentation on the uniform back in terms of, you know, forms and, uh, and uh, so they get, you look at his, you know, the, the uniform is wearing motorcycle helmet. So we got none of that back. He said, you should have. And I said, well, our, uh, the director of the funeral home said we did not get anything. And the assistant director said we did, but they had to wash the blood off the uniform and everything. There was like a conflict in, in descriptions of pains about that um, so that person that was the NCS that did try to help us uh, he eventually had to stop us because he was threatened uh, by uh, somebody I don't know he loses job he loses security clearance etc in 2014 we were helped by a friend who was former military and he wanted to take the photos and from the Sandy County Medical Examiner's office and also um, uh, through uh, Armed Forces and Medical Examiner's Office reports and the pictures, take them to a uh, coroner there. And what happened was the coroner thought this was a sign of murder and he wanted to contact Armed Forces and Medical Examiner's Office, Dover, Delaware. And they then, Dover, Delaware, called a Air Force base in Ohio, which called the coroner and said, well, uh, we're going to come to your office and uh, we're going to dispose of everything you have, uh, pictures and property that, uh, that uh, involving this young man's death. And he goes, I'll just, the coroner said, I'll just take care of myself. The coroner then called the person that set up this whole thing. And he said, what are you trying to do? And then the, the friend called us back and said, there's a government agent came to my house. He said, stop paying the flames for this young man's death. And if you don't, your Navy son will receive a, uh, a dishonorable discharge from the Navy. And uh, so he had to stop right there, did not want to talk anymore, no press, no nothing. And uh, anyway, it's just where we've been with four people uh, threatened uh, by government officials. And uh, it's just hard, hard to try to understand why this would happen to our son and why we're not getting the help 
as well. Uh, we went to into also some uh, sh uh, some newspapers, online newspapers such as Military Justice for All, been very helpful. Uh, True Crime podcasts, True Crime Lines uh, podcasts. That's also another one. Uh, in addition to uh, CatchMyKiller.com, and those are some of the things. Also, um, I can't think of the one uh, Unsolved Mysteries, which we're also on as well. So. Those are some of the things that we've been on trying to find out what's going on. So uh, I don't know what what happened to our son, but it's you know for four people and ourselves as family, we we do not believe it's a murder. I mean, we do not believe. Excuse me, we do not believe it's a suicide, but it's a murder, and um, it's just kind of we just you know. So I decided and that I decided to just try to talk to people and. Get the word out there the best I could. <laughs> okay, I have lots. Um, I guess what still doesn't make sense, and I'm all over my head, and I'm sure you've done it probably a trillion times. Same thing with the wife and the siblings and friends, and it just doesn't. Why would they do that? Why would they go out of so much work to cover something up that is plain as day not a suicide? Because I know, I know Bemis Keith very well to where I know he wouldn't spend time to write on his body to, th that, that's just not, and he was not gay at all. I know that very well so that he was not gay. Uh, he dated a few girls in Rockford and I, I've talked to him about stuff like that and I know for a fact he is not gay or was not gay and I just don't understand how somebody can close this case Tony and sleep ever like ever uh, I don't I mean I'm looking at everything that's on his body his clothes you know his furniture his his, uh, his house that is written these terrible, terrible words. And I don't know, on the back of his bullet hole, there's a Spanish word called spider, it's called araña. And I don't know how one could shoot oneself and then right on the back of his head, right in the back of his head, and then shoot oneself and miss that, miss that spelling, right? You know, so neatly. And it just does not make sense at all. It does not make sense. Uh, the NCIS agent that did help us uh, that was former former chief, etc. He says the guy's planted. You know, uh, one police officer we spoke to, his mom and I. He said, "If you're right-handed, the if gun falls, it's always going to fall right side up. I mean, it's going to be right side on the ground, left side up. You know, it's always going to fall the right way though for the right-hander. Left-hander may fall on the left-hand side, like you know, if you're shooting as a left-handed. You know, but." Um, it's just that, you know, I've had a couple of people tell me that uh, people that do labs and, and also investigators tell me that this planet it either been uh, fallen on his chest, would have been uh, fallen on, on, on his mouth and with the mo inside the motorcycle helmet, you know. So um, that's that's all we can tell you is this, that we tried and we've done blood tests. We've had the guns tested, uh, tried to talk to people. We get uh, like the change.org put it on uh, the uh, social pages, uh, those type of things. And we're just trying to get the word out there. That's all we're trying to do. I noticed as part of my little bit of uh, investigation, as far as, as you know, just looking up this case, you were looking for a certain amount of signatures online. Is that still needed or no? Uh, that as many as possible. It's got probably like 4,000 signatures right there, uh, maybe between three to 4,000 I'm looking at. It really hasn't gone up but much at all. I've tried to put, I think I've exhausted uh, my Facebook page with, with friends that can help out uh, as well. So um, I just tried the best I can, you know, and going from there. I'm going to attach some of the articles slash videos that you've already done concerning this investigation. I'll attach it in the YouTube description below here. Um, if anybody can out there can listen, especially those from the USS Lake Champlain, I'm not going to call it some names, but if there's anybody out there that can help this man and his family get some type of closure on this, I mean, I even want to rewrite 
Tyler Henry. I don't know if you've heard of him, the the, the um, Hollywood medium, but I, I just to find answers because this just doesn't make sense, and I don't understand why a sheriff's department or wherever NCIS or anybody could shut a f- case. When they know it, when they, I mean, I could, I don't even want to imagine what they saw when they first got there, but they knew that it wasn't suicide. It, you know, just your, everything you're proving from the gun to the, the number of bullets to the stuff written on his body, just, there's nothing. How could you shut? How could you shut that case? I just, it's just mind blowing. Uh, that's, that's what I'm thinking as well. If, um, I have a Facebook page. And it's a death of CPO John Keith Bemis. And if they go in there, it's like it'll give like a, a online uh, review of what uh, happened and also what we've done. But there's blue hyperlinks. And those blue hyperlinks will take you to a uh, Dropbox. You can, you know, you download Dropbox and then go through and download files as well. Or simply click on the links and then follow through the other choice they give you. And you can see the form signed by the officials. And so if they went through and they, they really wanted to look anyway, you know, uh, the names aren't going to matter, you know, and say, well, the son's on the name. Well, my name's on there. How dare you tell my name? It's, it's on my phone. The name's already on, on the line and it's been on there for a year or so. I mean, you know, um, you know so obviously it's not a problem for them because. You know, they it's been online and, and no one say anything. And the thing is, though, this is made public. Of course, that's a lot of things with public anyway. Newspapers and forms, a lot of things are made public. The thing is, though, you can see like the the uh, the uh, the from the Sandy Kim Medical Examiner's Office, Armed Forces Medical Examiner's Office, things like this. Uh, bullets that have uh, appear to have uh, like own sexual slurs on it. The clothing, his house, his helmet. Uh, you're going to have to literally take a close look at it you know you may see some things may not see some things you know the thing is though what i'm hearing from investigators it's position of the body the motorcycle helmet on the head that type of thing um you know we were told that uh, by some of his class uh, people his graduate class that uh, the navy said he just went home put his dress uniform, put his motorcycle helmet on and shot himself in the back. You know, and that did not happen. Uh, he was found on uh, dead on the floor wearing his blue khakis. And uh, if I got it right, you know, for his work uniform and his, uh, his motorcycle helmet. And you're going to have, it's just something that people really, really want to try to zero on it. They're going to have to look carefully and read. And uh, why isn't this stuff mentioned in the courts? I don't know. But uh, uh, it's just that um, it's just so much there that it needs questions need to be answered, I think. What was it like when you got there, Tony? Like, for me, I automatically was thinking, I'm going door to door myself. F the cops. Like, I'm going to do it myself. Did you and your wife just start asking anybody? Did you see something? What what was it like? It must be just super awful, first off, just being in that presence of that apartment after what happened. First is is disturbing. Keith's mom didn't even go. She didn't want to see us. She really didn't want to go on a trip because it was stressful. So being there and it's just a shock and, and just like being lost. Did speak with his girlfriend and also his neighbors. They said no, nobody would do something like this. Keith, the Keith that we know of, Keith was well liked. Um, you know, there was not much lighting in front of Keith's uh, doorway you know, when you went in. Um, you know, it's um, just kind of like, wow, it's just like unbelievable, like surreal, and especially when the sheriff's department wouldn't talk to us or seemed like the, the person from Sandy County Medical Examiner's office would say, no, I'm right, you're wrong, uh, I've got the angle, uh, the bullet right, and uh, I'd tell the Lemon Grove Sheriff's Department, which didn't even know where the bullet was, couldn't even find it, I had to show them exactly where it was and, tra- and the trajectory, the angle. And show them why it was there myself. So, uh, you know, and she said that uh, um, uh, there could have been NCIS there and they showed no identification. But uh, one of the NCIS agents, his name is Jeff, that's his actual name, uh, said, uh, We're sorry about you. I'm sorry about your death, but forget about your son. That's what he said. You know, 
Yes. And, uh, and then the, uh, uh, let's see, the uh, officer that signed the uh, deputy, I mean, the uh, sheriff's report. Uh, I can't think of his name right now, but I, I asked him, I said, you know, he wants to take, you want to take a look at his picture. And he came back to us with a message. We have more important cases than your sons to investigate. So uh, they left out a message. Do you guys hear this right now? Imagine going home or getting the news, which nobody wants to hear from a parent that one was a kid was kidnapped or somebody was raped or killed. Nobody as a parent wants to get or, or nobody wants to get it in general. But as a parent, I know having two kids and two amazing stepkids, so basically four kids myself. I would never want to be on some investigation of something crazy like this. And just to think that more than one person knows at least the truth of the fact that it was not suicidal. There's some officers or probably multiple people that have investigated this and know for a fact that there could be more done. And I just don't, that, that is the thing I just cannot wrap around. And I hope that at some point in the future, somebody that was involved in this case, it will get to them. I'm hoping it gets to them to where they're like, I'm no longer part of this. This is what happened. Blah, blah, blah. God, just to get more, you know what I mean? To get more closure on the fact that, you know, it was, it was a murder and how they could do it to this guy. I, I, folks, like and I'm not just saying this for this interview. I knew him real well. And he loved to volunteer. He would go to church. He loved movies. He loved, um, I don't know if he kept it, but he had this Ford Thunderbird that he loved too. He loved this darn Thunderbird. But he uh, always had something to do. Always, guys. Like, I swear, he'd be like, you want to go to church? You want to go to the beach? You want to go to the mall? You want to go... Like he was always doing something and always trying to uplift other people. This guy worked his entire life trying to become an E7 or above, which is chief in the Navy. And he gets to this point and then decides to end his life. No, folks. No, no, no. I agree with Tony a thousand percent. We need to reopen this case. So. Again, Tony, can you say the website you you go to? I, now, if you Google also, if you Google the letters CPO, CPO, John Keith Bemis, it will come up all over Google. Like he said, there's some podcasts. There's a YouTube video with Unsolved Mysteries. Please do anything you can. If you're somebody with some power or somebody who wants to help us, it's been over 10 years that this man's son was murdered brutally and just it just hurts my feelings to think my friend was written on and drawn on and people would think that he committed suicide when he couldn't have done that in the back of his head like you said in other areas on his body he wouldn't have done that you know i'm sorry tony i went off but go ahead if there's anything please say if there's anything else people can uh, contact you with um i want to say that uh thank you jeff for that uh, I want to say that, uh, again, it's uh, uh, Military Justice for All, and uh, that, you just, his Facebook page also has its own website, and related to that, it's, it's very, it looks at different types of people that suffered, that have military deaths that are suspicious, or all of a sudden, the families are not getting help, being turned away. Fort Hood is an example of that. All around the country and the world, many deaths not enough help no explanation those type of things i can give you names but it's not my job to give you names then i won't have permission to say that but if you look at the military sites any military sites that deal with death and facebook you know uh, they're there um and then another one is crime lines true crime podcast uh unsolved mysteries those type of things uh, catchmykiller.com you know you have to go through back and uh, uh, that was done in like September of 2020 and uh, you have to go back that far you have to really go back to the back issues uh, you know those type of things I want to say some of the things that if people want to look at, they're bold enough to look at the pictures 
uh, of Keith's body. There's uh, numbers are imprinted on his tongue. There's a number five on this back part of his left gum, uh, you know, in his mouth. It's not to mark where it's a pit tooth of anything like this. Uh, so people say that's type of a uh, change is coming. Uh, and also looked like he was sodomized, uh, like with chains or something or with uh, dog tags. Uh, as well as his penis had, it looks like a drill, like his penis was drilled. Uh, and also numbers right on the, the, the shaft of it. Uh, and as well as a lady holding the baby, looking at his private parts. Uh, homosexual shirt was the left butt cheek. Uh, also on, uh, on his face, his right cheek. Uh, letters on him, numbers on his lips. Uh, as well and it's just it looks like a chunk of skin is missing in the back part of his left side of his head uh, these people were crafty enough to make it obvious like they didn't care or clever enough you had to look for it and uh, one of the P police department uh, as San Sandy County Sheriff Department I was encouraged by the President of the United States to contact them my, his mother and I wrote to the president, the president's uh, White House said, this is what you need to do, contact the local authorities there and start there. And I got a hold of a detective or a uh, sheriff and I set up, so what do you think? He goes, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a teacher. He said, obviously you have enough time to look for what you want to look for and that's all you do. He goes, I'm, I'm, a, I, he goes, I'm a sheriff and I've seen uh, I know when something's a murder, this is not a murder. And I said, I'm, and I exactly, I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, I appreciate your time. And when I was trying to do hang up, he just, he just kept going on how right he was and how wrong. So the folks that I talked to, uh, some of the folks I talked to from uh, officials from California, they have the I'm right attitude, you're wrong attitude. And that's why they're not being objective, they're not being factual, they're not putting enough time on it. And, and if I'm seeing these things, and three or four other people are seeing these things, or things that are suspicious, why aren't this being, this being reopened again, as well as the ones like from Texas, from uh, North Carolina, uh, from other parts of the world? There are so many, there's so much, the deaths are so much older, but yet they deserve that same type of attention as. Keith's family does, and they, they, it's just not right. You know, someone giving their life to help serve, protect, and, and honor our country so that lives are protected, even around the world, to help other lives become better. And they're not being protected by our country, our government, our military. Just like, okay, next, it's like, it's like, seems to me like, not, not always, but seems to me at that point in time, like an assembly line, next, 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 you know, that type of thing. And the people that serve the military deserve to be honored, respected, and being thanked for what they have sacrificed and given up, what they have to do to help protect and help others in the world as well. They deserve much more than what they're receiving they really do right right absolutely yeah that you would you would automatically as a parent or or even an individual joining the service would never think that something like this could happen and that it would be covered up and you know it just doesn't no it's such a crazy story did you this might be a rough question but did you see Keith before John? Well, I call him Keith, but did you see Keith before uh, his body? Did you see it in person? Uh, I tried to, but the uh, the Master Chief, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but she was the one that was there at the apartment during the day that things were being investigated. She cleaned the house. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Wow! Why? Why would you clean the house? Why would it, Why would somebody investigating a murder clean the house during that that week? You know, I was told by another Navy person that uh, three people were sent to clean Keith's house so they wouldn't we wouldn't find something that Keith would want us to see. And I'm thinking Keith is the type of guy where if he was there, it's there. Sorry about that. You know, it's never not bad. Bad. It was not bad at all against the lops, you know. What's you know? You know I'm sorry, I feel that way. But Keith is the type that didn't do something to break the law, you know, except speed. 
you know, just speed of the car. That's that's his only thing, you know. Um, but things like those things I'm talking about that are, you know, when other people may not see the same thing that are best against, but see why it's a murder because of the, sh- the position the body's in, wedged between the closet door and the bed. They got a helmet on. They said that looks like in a small amount of blood. We even had people that are military people that are friends of Keys in the home area that went out and took a, a, a watermelon, put it in the his Kiwan Keys helmets, shot it with a 40, and it made the size of a quarter. The second time it happened is like in September of 2021. Uh, the same man tried it again, and we had an investigator there. And it made a smaller size. However, the investigator said there should have been more blood around on the, on the walls, the doors, the mirrors, the bedding, the floor. And he goes, something's just not right here. And he goes, it's a murder because he's got his helmet on and he's got uh, a little blood and the position of the body, things like this. Uh, where I used to, I used to work at, it's a Ohio school, uh, you know, uh, not, it's just, it's just, um, oh, it's, it's this weather, it's a, it's a, it's a Northwestern Ohio school and it has four, it has roughly about 1700 kids in it. We used to go through lockdowns and if somebody had a bomb threat, ladies and gentlemen, we're now in lockdown. We had to lock the doors, put uh, a, a, a blinder run the door, turn the lights off, turn the windows off, uh, close the windows, uh, turn the blinds, uh, close the blinds, everybody sit in the back room, nobody talking, and wait for the administrator to say, we're evacuating. And we moved as a, 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 a group under about 2,000 people. We moved rather quick, quickly, especially with, you know, thousands of parents are waiting for their, ch- their kids. So I don't know why this is not, I mean, Keith, Keith loved life. He honored God first. He honored, you know, he loved his family. He loved God, loved his country, he wanted to serve, make something out of himself, not be a uh, a burden on himself, uh, us financially. He wanted to uh, work on engines when he was done. He wanted to get married, have a family, uh, praise God, all those things. He did things like help put his girlfriend in Texas through college so that she could take care of uh, her kids. She went to be a nurse. Uh, he gave blood uh, to a uh, uh, family in Ohio here that uh, two girls, twin girls had cancer. He and his football team uh, mates during the high school times uh, gave blood. Uh, you know, uh, also, uh, if he, if he, uh, you know, uh, somebody wants to start a business like massage therapy, get a license, things like this, and need an office, he was willing to give uh, one of his rooms, you know, that type of thing. I mean, he really wanted to get back so that people can uh, lift up their lives, have their lives lifted up, improve, you know, be, be, just be lifted up, you know, feed their spirits. That's the way he was. I know that firsthand, and anybody from the USS Lake Champlain knows that too. I'm telling you that the intro part I say, when we came on, okay, because I came on after him, he came back from deployment. And I joined uh, in 01, but by the time I got to the boat, we were, I think, on the base for five or six months. So it must have been like June when they came back. I can't remember, around then. And that would have been 02. So when we got on the boat, me and like 50 other people, there's probably 15 of us were engineers, um, there was like nobody welcoming to us. Nobody was like excited to see new people. <laughs> they just wanted to get off the boat and see their family. And I understand that. But one person, and that was your son. He was always helping. And the first day I got there and until I left, he was always there to help me no matter what. We were legitimately friends. And like I said, he stayed at my home after I got out. And he dated some girl in Rockford for a little while. Like I said, also, she was Hispanic. But I remember doing a couple volunteer trips in Alaska with him when I went on deployment with him. And we, um, he was always trying to do something like that. Go to Metro Christian Center and don't, uh, uh, serve food. Or he, I remember them actual times because I know he was working on his volunteer medal that he probably ended up getting. But what, I guess for Tony, for the address, I know we're wrapping this up. What, if we go to 2012 
can you say like his whereabouts exactly his like apartment number or or his address and just say if you know some information can you please let us know like where whereabouts was he found valley california and i can't remember the apartment number at this time for the street but it's, it's in spring valley california and uh i could probably get this to you uh, hang on for a second hang on so early august the first week of august 2012 folks go ahead go ahead tony okay it's okay yeah yeah no problem i'm gonna pull that part out i was just gonna say but what you could look first week of august spring valley california apartment complex we're gonna get you the exact if you we're gonna get you the exact address and all that stuff here coming up tony thank you so much um for this and folks again if you google cpo john keith bemis b-e-m-i-s you will find it on Google. You will find it on YouTube. You'll find it on Unsolved Mysteries. If you're from the Lake Champlain and one of my former shipmates, can we please put any type of effort known to man to try to find out what happened to our shipmate, uh, a great patriot, a great friend, Keith Bemis, Chief Petty Officer ENC Bemis is what his name would have been. And it is... Um, but if you have any information regarding the case or any way you think you can help us get answers for his family and friends, please let me know. Email catching up with Carter. That's no G in the middle. Catching up with Carter at gmail.com. You can message me on Facebook. You can message um, Tony. There's there's links. When you look it up online, you'll find it. Thank you so much um, for your time, Tony. And I'm so sorry for your loss. I, even though it's been so long I'm so sorry for it I appreciate that Yes, yes Alright everybody You heard that bone chilling story That still has a lot of questions unanswered Involving my friend U.S. Navy shipmate To many people out there uh, Son Brother Just a great guy John Keith Bemis Look him up on Google His story is out there if you want to help there's ways to contact you can contact me um if you want a podcast or you have something that somebody should know about please email us at catching up with carter no g in the middle catching up with carter at gmail.com you guys have a good one take care and uh please stay safe thank you for spending an hour of your time with us now we do yourself a favor check us out on catching up with carter and fam show do yourself another favor and follow us on facebook youtube and insta our dog's also up there, so you'll be doing yourself a third favor. And we'll see you next week. Toodles.